we're going to wrestle with two questions. What are spiritual gifts, and what are they for? Now, you may believe that you already know the answer to that question, but I think as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there are certain things that we may have forgotten. Now, before we get into those questions, we have to answer a question that really Paul has been addressing since the beginning of his letter to the church in Corinth. Before we can say what spiritual gifts are and what are they for, we have to defer, define the church. Because the reality is, spiritual gifts and the church cannot be separated. They are in, intricate, intricately connected. So let's first answer that question. What is the church and what does it mean to be the church? Remember, we've been asking previously, when is the church no longer the church? Paul's Really, and I'm really excited about the next three chapters here in Corinthians because Paul is now really turning a corner in addressing the church in Corinth. He has pointed out so many of their problems, so many of their issues, but as a loving father so often does, he doesn't leave them hopeless. He now turns the corner and provides them the road back, the way back to actually being the body of Christ. So what is the church? What, what is the church? If you ask 10 different people, they're going to give you 10 different answers. Some people say it's a quasi-governmental entity with a hierarchy of leadership that tells people what to do and how to live. Some people will say that it's a social services institution, and it exists to give out food boxes and gas cards and bus passes. Some people will say that it's that building on the way to work that I pass, that giant structure that has a steeple. Some people say that it's a social club where people think the same, they look the same, they talk the same, and they share group hugs and they sing kumbaya. That's kind of an appealing place. Some say that it's a business, it's a corporation, and it operates in services such as weddings and funerals and baby dedications and baptisms. And there may be small amounts of truths in each of these things, but they're very, very misguided. And to be honest with you, the church is somewhat responsible for many of these misconceptions. Scripture tells us that the church is something very different than these things. I like the way John MacArthur puts it. He says the church, the body of Christ, is an eternal, indestructible, supernatural, living organism. The church is an eternal, indestructible, supernatural, living organism created by God for the purposes of God and at the head of all of it, the man Jesus Christ. The church is alive. It's indestructible. Jesus tells us in P- tells Peter in Matthew 16, he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. It's eternal. We know that Jesus will return and when he returns, he will present his church to his father, unblemished, without spot or wrinkle, as Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 5. And then today, we will see that the church is supernatural and it is alive. Well, it's supposed to be supernatural and alive. See, the church in Corinth reflected none of these things. Instead, there were deep rifts in that body of believers. There was deep tears, Paul says, in that church. There were divisions over apostolic leadership, divisions over philosophy, divisions over theology, divisions over when to worship and how to worship and what to eat and what to wear. There were divisions over whether or not to get married or to remain single. They were suing each other in the public square members of the same church arguing and fighting in public. They practice worldliness, sexual immorality, adultery, fornication, and those that weren't practicing those things, they, they never disciplined those things. They never stood up against those things. They turned a blind eye. Sometimes they even embraced those things. And on top of all of that, they had turned the Lord's Supper into a drunken party for the rich. 
And in the midst of all that, they boasted in their spiritual gifts. They boasted in their spiritual gifts. That brings us to this section of Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. Because in verse 1 of chapter 12, what does Paul write? Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant, which they were. Here they, were, here they are boasting in their spiritual gifts, but their church is fractured and drowning in sin. How in the world could they be boasting in spiritual gifts when they were living in the condition that they were living in? Yes, they were ignorant about spiritual gifts, just as the church is today. See, many churches today, church bodies, they live at the two, two extremes of spiritual gifts. They live at either the charismania extreme or the calculated Extreme. What do I mean by that? Charismania. What is charismania? It's extra biblical nonsense, is what it is. Things that are practiced that are not seen in Scripture, that have no edifying property, and essentially they're nonsense. I won't go into too much detail about them. But it's taking the Holy Spirit and making it something strange, perverted, and weird. And it does not build up the body of Christ. But on the other extreme, we have churches that have pushed out the Spirit completely and replaced the Spirit with calculated formulas, business models, business plans, built solely on human ability, human talents, human wisdom, where God isn't needed, the Holy Spirit isn't needed, we got this. We have this figured out. We have the business plan. We have the business model. If we do things, if we add one plus two, we get three. And the Spirit of God is not needed. See, there should be no surprise that there is so much confusion regarding spiritual gifts because anything of eternal significance, the devil is always there to confuse it, isn't he? Anything that's valuable, anything that's important in the kingdom of God, the devil is there trying to confuse it and pervert it and twist it and make it look like something that it was never meant to be. And he's accomplished that when it comes to the area of spiritual gifts. So Paul is going to come against that confusion in the next three chapters of Corinthians. Paul is going to to provide the church a way back to being the true church, a way back to being the true body of Christ. And that's why I'm so excited about these chapters, because we will learn as a body what it means to be the body. Now, Paul has already addressed a laundry list of problems within the church. And now he says, concerning spiritual gifts, I do not want you to be ignorant. You are ignorant, is what he's saying. I don't want you to be ignorant anymore. But that first verse we read, now concerning spiritual gifts, that word gifts does not appear in the original Greek text. What Paul is saying that there is now concerning spirituals, now concerning spiritual things, now concerning the supernatural. But we know from the context of the next few chapters that he's referring to those supernatural gifts given by God himself through his spirit to the believer. It's appropriate that we add gifts there because that's what Paul is referring to. But Paul is talking about the supernatural, things that we are not able to do in our flesh, things that we are not able to do with human wisdom and human logic, things that, are, that we are completely dependent on the Lord for. That's what Paul is dealing with, the supernatural. Now, to unpack and wrestle with that term, spiritual gifts, we have to go to the place that it's mentioned first in Scripture. 
And that's in Romans chapter 1, verse 11, if you'll open there, please. Romans chapter 1, verse 11. We're going to gain some valuable insight on what spiritual gifts are and what they're for. Romans 1, verse 11. Paul writes, I long to see you. I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. You might want to underline spiritual gift and established. Paul says, I desire to come to you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. At first hearing, it sounds like Paul is going to come like Santa Claus bearing gifts. I want to give a gift to you. I want to give a gift to you. Almost as if he's giving them their spiritual gift. But that's a misunderstanding of that passage. What he's saying is, I've been uniquely gifted. Paul, I think we would all agree, has the gift of exhortation, the gift of teaching. And he's saying, I want to come to you with my spiritual gifts, the gifts that God has graciously given me, and I want to give them to you so that you may be what? Established so that you may be built up. The word there means to be set fast, to be set firmly in a specific direction. So one thing we know for sure, and you probably have already heard this before, but we need to lay this down as the foundation of spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are not to be hoarded. They are for others. The spiritual gifts that God has given a believer, they are not for us, They are for others. Again, this is Spiritual Gifts 101. I know you've heard this before, but we have to understand that. They are for the strengthening of the body of Christ. They are to build one another up. Paul says, I want to come to you so that I may build you up through the spiritual gifts that God has given me. I want to exercise the gifts God has given me, and in doing so, I want to build you up. But that leaves us with another question. We may say, okay, we understand that. We understand that gifts are for the building up of the church. What does it mean to build up one another? Honestly, what does it mean to build up our brothers and sisters? What does it mean to come together as a fellowship, exercise our spiritual gifts, and build up one another? We know it's not physically, obviously. So what are we building up in one another? Well, Paul goes on to tell us in verse 12. Romans 1, verse 12. That is, I I desire to come to you. I want to impart and exercise my spiritual gift so that you may be built up, so that you may be established, so that you may be strengthened and set firmly in a specific direction. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. What are we building up in one another? We're building up faith. We're we're building up a trust in God. That's what we all desperately need to grow in. We need to grow in our trust in God so that that gap between God speaking and us responding closes. So that the only words on our lips when God speaks is, Yes, Lord, I will. Amen. That's where we need to grow. For most of us, for all of us, the struggle in life is trusting what God has said. That's why we sin. We sin because we doubt God's provision. We seek to meet a legitimate need in an illegitimate way. We don't wait on the Lord. We can trace all our sins, all our struggles in life back to a lack of faith and trust. And Paul says, exercise your spiritual gifts so that you may build faith in one another. Exercising spiritual gifts build the faith of the giver and the receiver. Just like faith and works are are brothers. Faith and works are brothers. They can't be separated. If you have faith, you have works. It's the same way with spiritual gifts and the building of faith. They cannot be separated. 
We exercise our spiritual gifts to build the faith of a brother or sister. And when we talk about the edification of the church, when we talk about building the church, we are talking about the church growing in their faith in God. We have to lay that foundation first to understand what Paul says moving forward. Look at verse 2. You know that you were Gentiles, carried away by these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that the Lord is Jesus is Lord except the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. What does Paul say first? You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols. Paul isn't using a kindergarten insult here. That word dumb, what does it mean? Mute. It means powerless. It means voiceless, speechless. He he says, you pray to these dumb idols, and they never answered. You pray to these idols, you pleaded with them, and they never responded. Because they're just that, dumb idols. They have no power. They have no ability. You created them. And then you turn around and you worship them. Isaiah talks about this idol that you've cut from a tree, and half of it you carve into an idol, the other half you throw on the fire to use it to keep warm. How is that a God? Paul says, you used to turn to things of the world for purpose, for power. And those things never responded. They never answered. But now you serve the one true God with infinite power, a God who responds, a God who is able to do more than you could ever ask, hope, and think. That's the God that you serve. Do your your lifestyles reflect that? You used to serve God dumb idols, you now serve the living God. Do your lives reflect that? And what's the answer? Not at all. The church in Corinth looked no different now that they were serving God than when they worshiped these powerless idols. And that's Paul's problem here. And the reason was they neglected their spiritual gifts. Paul goes on to address a rumor that was floating around the church. He says, if you pray in the Spirit and you confess in the Spirit that Jesus Christ is Lord, only the Holy Spirit can do that in you. Or if you say that Jesus is accursed, that does not come by the Spirit of God. Now, we would hear that and say, of course, that that makes complete sense. But understand what he's talking about here. There was a rumor floating around the church that if you pray in the Spirit, if you ask for the Spirit of God, you could be opening yourself up to demons. If you went to God your Father and said, Lord, I want your Holy Spirit... I'm yielding my life to you, grant me the power of your spirit, then you could be opening yourself up to demons and you could begin to curse the name of Jesus Christ. And Paul says, no, if you go to your father and ask for his spirit, he will grant that to you. Didn't Jesus say the same thing in Luke 11? Verse 10, for everyone who asks, what? Receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If then, being evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So just as so many people live on the extreme of the Holy Spirit in strange, weird behavior, there are others who live in the opposite 
extreme, where they're fearful of the Holy Spirit working in their lives. They're afraid of what might happen. But Jesus tells us, ask, go to the Father, ask for the Holy Spirit, yield your life to the power of the Holy Spirit, and God will answer that prayer in a very practical, life-changing, real way. There's nothing to be afraid of. And then Paul goes on to address the diversities that exist within the church. What does he say? He says there's differing gifts, there's differing ministries, and there's differing activities. So there's diversity in gifts, diversity in ministries, and diversity in activities. Let's unpack that a little bit. That word gifts, that's where we get our word charisma. That's where we get our word charisma. Paul says the differing gifts, they come from the same what? Spirit. The differing gifts come from the same spirit. Then the differing ministries, that means administrations, offices, roles, the different roles we have not only in the church but in our lives, they come from the same Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says the activities, the operation of those gifts, that's where we get our word for energy, the Greek word that Paul uses there. It comes from the same God. So he's addressing three things here. Let's look at this. He's talking about the gifts that we have been given, the unique spiritual supernatural gifts that each of you have and, each of, and I have that come from the Father. We've been uniquely gifted to use these gifts in very specific roles. What are those roles? There's all kinds of different roles. Some of you are mothers. Some of you are not mothers. So you can't fill that role because you're a man. Some of you are fathers. Some of you are pastors, some of you are teachers, some of you are, you name it. There's different offices in the church, there's different offices within the family, there's different roles. And then even within those roles, there's different ways to exercise those gifts. Me exercising my gifts as a teacher looks differently than Pastor John exercising his gifts as a teacher. We have different personalities, different life experiences. But here's the truth that Paul points out. It's all the same God. See, here's the problem with our culture, with society, and with humanity. If there's differences, there's division. Humanity divides over its differences, doesn't it? whether it's age, race, dress code, socioeconomic status, if there's differences, we divide. The enemy loves to get in there and cause tears. But here's the problem, and it's not really a problem at all. We make it a problem. Paul says, because of your unique gifts and because of the unique ministries and because of the unique ways of exercising the gifts in these ministries, there's going to be differences. Things are going to look different. People are going to be different. But that's a good thing because it's all for the same purpose, and that's glorifying God. We make the mistake of surrounding ourselves by people who look and act like us. We go to churches where everyone looks and acts and thinks just like us. So you have one church that is incredibly gifted in one area and totally neglects all the other gifts. We are comfortable in sameness. We are comfortable when people are surround us that are just like us, but that's not the church. Paul is emphasizing diversity within the church. Sameness is not a good thing unless we're talking about one God, one Jesus Christ, one Holy Spirit. We are all unique in our giftings, our roles, and the way that we exercise those gifts in those roles. Look at verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit, here we go, the manifestation of the Spirit through our individual spiritual gifts is given to each one for what? The profit of all. 
For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. He's going to start listing some of the spiritual gifts. This isn't an exhaustive list by any means, but he's just giving examples here. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of those tongues. But one in the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact the body is not one member, but many." If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the smelling be? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if there were all one member where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. We hear the tone of Paul's message here. There's unity in diversity. We are all different, yet we are all one body. We are a living organism united in a single cause to glorify the name of Jesus Christ. We all have different gifts, different roles in which we use these gifts, and different ways in which we use these gifts in those roles, but it's for the same purpose, to build the faith of one another. You know, here's an example outside of the context of church. Because I believe God gives us spiritual gifts not only when we're in the corporate church, but in that small family, that small community, dad, mom, brothers, and sisters. See, I believe God gives moms and dads the gift of discernment when it comes to their kids. I remember when I was little, I went into a, well, to be honest, I don't remember this. I've been told that this happened. Maybe it didn't. Who knows? But my mom and dad took me to the hospital because of severe stomach pain. And they said, oh, it'll pass. It's, it's nothing. And it didn't pass. So two days later, they took me in again, and they said the same thing. Oh, he's just got an upset stomach. Changed his diet. He'll be okay. And it didn't pass. Finally, my parents took me back in, and my mom knew something specific was wrong. And she told them, give him an x-ray. So they gave me an x-ray. And what did they find? A penny. I decided to eat a penny. I was 16. 16 years old. Or four. Unique discernment. The role is mother. The gift is discernment. I remember another time, and this time I was in high school, unfortunately. It was two in the morning and I hadn't come home yet. And the Lord told my parents to go in my backpack. So they went in my backpack and found a little note that had been folded up about this big. It was tiny at the bottom. It looked like trash. But my parents, guide, the Lord guided my parents right to it. They unfolded it. It was a flyer for a party. They drove to that party, found me, picked me up. My mom kicked in the door, walked in, <laughs> said, where, where is my son? I remember hearing her voice. Whoa. Where is my son? Parents, do you relate to this? God has given you a spiritual gift, that gift of discernment. That's just an example of how gifts work. And God works these things in unique ways. You can't base a formula on it. You can't do the same thing and get the same result, it is based on a dependence on God himself. See, 
here's what I've seen in the church. There sometimes is an unhealthy obsession with spiritual gifts. We get our eyes on the gifts themselves and not on Jesus Christ. We get our eyes on the gifts to a point where it borderlines idolatry. There's this infatuation with discovering what my gifts are and exercising those gifts, and then my identity is found in that gift. I'm Daniel. I'm Daniel, discerner of spirits, and I'm going to go around, and I'm going to look in your eyes, and I'm going to discern what spirit you're of. There's people that are that way. I worked with someone in the health insurance industry that in their auto signature, they listed their spiritual gift. I think it's important to know your spiritual gift. But I don't think Paul is emphasizing the individual gifts themselves so that they should be exalted in any way. In fact, as we go through the chapters, we will see him talking about the individual gifts. And the church in Corinth, they were obsessed over speaking in tongues. They thought that that was just the the pinnacle of being gifted in the Spirit. But there are things more important than being able to articulate exactly what our spiritual gift is. Open to Romans chapter 12. Again, I think it is important to know what your spiritual gift is. But it's wrong to obsess over it. Look at what Paul says. It's really a chapter, Romans chapter 12, that parallels 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul says in verse 3, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt each one a measure of faith. I say through the grace given to me. Paul's saying the ability to even speak this word of wisdom to you comes from what? The grace of God. So through the grace that God has given me to speak to you a word of wisdom and to everyone who is among you, don't think more highly about yourself than you ought to think. Think soberly, because God is the one that dealt to you a measure of faith. Jump down to verse 6. Having then what? Gifts. Having gifts differing according to what? The grace that is given to us. Let us use them. Let us use them. If it's prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our... Okay, do we see the link here between gifts and faith? Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. And he who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. There's two points here that I think Paul's making that are even more important than being able to articulate what your actual gift is. First and foremost, we know gifts and faith go hand in hand, but we need to add something to that wonderful partnership. And that's grace. The graciousness of God. See, the word charisma, it comes from the root word charis, which means grace. The word that we get our our word gift from comes from the word grace. And Paul writes, through the graciousness of God, I exhort you. See, Paul had the gift of exhortation, and all too often, and I've done this before, I attribute that gift to his personality. Like Paul was just a unique man, and the way that he spoke and he taught was just unique to him. But the reality is, it wasn't about him. I think if I said that to Paul, he would reject that to my face. Because he says, through the graciousness of God, I exhort you. I'm exercising my gift that has been given to me by God. Not through any merit of my own. It is God's gift that he gives to me. And he gives me the faith to exercise that gift. It starts and ends with him. So nobody can boast in their gifts. No one. 
Every spiritual gift that leads to the building of another's faith is given without merit to that believer from God himself. They didn't, it's just like salvation. We didn't earn it. We don't deserve it. It's not by merit that we have it. If you can teach, you teach well because God gave you that gift. If you have the ability to discern, it's not because you studied a book on discernment. It's because God has given you a unique gift. If you have the gift of administration, it's not because you've practiced it and got better and better and better at it. It's because God has given you that gift and he's grown it in you and you cannot boast about it. It's not about you. See, the believer has nothing to boast about other than the graciousness of God. That's it. There's too many people that exercise their gifts and think it's about them. And then it's no longer exercising their gift. Every gift comes from God without personal merit of our own. If you take pride today in the fact that you're an effective teacher, knock it off. That's like taking pride in the fact that you have blue eyes. Did someone ever tell you that at the store? Hey, you have really, really nice eyes. Thank you, I made them myself. <laughs> that's, that's what it's like when we take credit for our gifts. True exercising of gifts come from a humble heart. I don't believe gifts can, spiritual gifts can even be exercised until we know fully where they have come from. Because we're talking about exercising a gift in faith, through faith, to build faith. A humble heart. You know what? As I get older, humility is a characteristic that I start to value more than any other. Like, I, I enjoy being around humble people. People where you don't have to worry about offending them by saying something that you knew you didn't mean and and people that are just willing to understand their position in Christ. Where you don't have to walk on eggshells because you'll hurt their ego. I want to be that kind of person too. Humility is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And true exercising of gifts come from a humble heart. and understanding of where those gifts came from. In the church in Corinth, they missed that totally. They thought their gifts were about them. And that still exists in the church today. Here's the second point. Spiritual gifts build faith, but again, they also require faith to be exercised. If a teacher is going to teach a class, they have to approach that class in faith that God will use them in that ministry, right? What good is a teacher that doubts that God's going to use them? that doubts that God's going to give them the ability to share with these young men and women something that will build their own faith. See, for a teacher to teach with faith, that God will speak through them, then the hearer grows in their faith as they hear the word of God. So don't, don't get too confused in this. I know it's, it's kind of uh, faith to faith to faith, but listen again. Spiritual gifts work through faith, trusting in God that he will use us for the purpose of building faith in others, trusting that God will build up others in their trust in him. And who is the author and finisher of faith? Jesus Christ. No room to boast in any of this. So this brings us to something that, again, I think is, is forgotten. If faith comes from God, faith comes from Jesus Christ, he needs to be gracious to give that to us. And then in that faith, we can exercise our gifts and it builds up the faith of somebody else. If it starts and ends with God himself, where does natural ability come into play? Think about this for a second. What's the difference between natural ability and spiritual gifts? The church today has a hard time discerning the difference. They look very similar sometimes. If someone comes up and leads us in a stirring rendition of our great God, and vocally it's 
gives you goosebumps, aren't we quick to say, man, that is anointed? That person is exercising their spiritual gifts because we're looking at the talent. All too often we look at talent and automatically assume that it's spirit-led, that it's anointed, that it's from God. And that's a very easy way to get off track. Because then what we start to do is we start to value human talent over humility. We start to value human ability over a life surrendered to God, dependent on God. We start to ask, is he able to? That's the important question for us. Is he able to instead of, is he humble enough to? Because congregations today can barely tell the difference between anointed and talented. See, there's a practice in churches today where they put paid secular musicians on worship teams. What happens when an individual sees this rock star guitar player who's extremely talented and an individual in the congregation goes up to him after the service and says, man, you got some rocking abilities. You're an amazing guitar player. How's that secular individual going to respond? What direction is that secular individual going to point that person in the church audience when he comes up and praises him for his abilities? You know what he's going to say? Thanks, I've been playing for 20 years. If you like my playing, come hear me at the bar down the street. I play there every Monday night. Seriously, what can that individual say? Spiritual gifts build the faith of others. How can someone that does not have a relationship with Jesus Christ build someone else's faith? How can they operate in faith? That's what happens when human ability and talent become more important than the true gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's what was wrong in Corinth. That's what's wrong today. We value human ability now more than God's Holy Spirit. And we need to return to a place where God's Holy Spirit always trumps human ability. The Spirit of God cannot be replaced by formulas. It can't be replaced by worldly wisdom. Because when it does, the body of Christ no longer grows in their faith. Systems can never replace the Spirit. And it's scary because systems on the outside can look very much like a spirit-filled fellowship. First Peter 4, verse 10. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. That means if anyone speaks, let them speak as if they're speaking directly from the mouth of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. The church doesn't need talented men and women. The church needs humble men and women who are looking to build the faith of their brothers and sisters. Are you sitting here wondering what your spiritual gifts are? I'll tell you how to find out. Look for opportunities to build the faith of your brothers and sisters. And the way that God uses you uniquely, that's your spiritual gift. Maybe as a woman, he's given you the ability to see other hurting women and you desire to heal them and come alongside them, comfort them, counsel them, provide that shoulder to lean on. You may have the gift of healing. Healing is not always physical healing and oftentimes it's not physical healing. It's healing the brokenhearted. So instead of maybe taking a test to find your spiritual gift, not that there's anything wrong with that, but let's apply it in real time. 
Look around and ask yourself, how can I build the faith of somebody else? Lord, show me. Give me opportunity. And as he gives you opportunity, I fully believe he will reveal to you your gift or your gifts. But it will always come from faith and lead to more faith. It will always come from trusting in God and lead to another individual trusting God more. That's what it means to build up the church, and that's why we have spiritual gifts. Let's close. Look at verse 22. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker and are necessary. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be wet, weaker are necessary. Remember, the church in Corinth, the hierarchy of the world, the social statuses of the world had seeped into the church. So if you're affluent, you have a higher position in the church. And then if you're poor, you're a weaker vessel. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker, no, they're necessary, Paul says. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, remember he's talking about worldly wisdom, on those we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts, we have greater modesty. But our presentable parts, those that we look at and we think, oh, wow, that person has it all together. On those we have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks, that there should be no schism in the body, but the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. And if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually, and God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, variety of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all works of miracles, workers of miracles, do all have gifts of healings, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret tongues but earnestly desire the best gifts. And yet, this is called a teaser, and yet I show you a more excellent way, which he'll dive into in chapter 13. It's funny, we're talking about supernatural gifts, and what does he list? Administration. See, we think of the supernatural as a prophetic word or a healing or speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues. But I think some of the most essential gifts are the practical gifts. It's a supernatural gift, and I hate to be redundant, but it is a supernatural gift when it starts by faith and it builds faith. So I think of, and I hate to point out people, but she's not in here, so her head can't grow, but I think of Ann Ross. She has a gift of administration, but it's through that gift that we are able to do many of the things that we do. She has a heart for organization, but it's not just an earthly talent. It's just not a natural ability. It's been built and maintained and grows through the Spirit of God, and we all benefit from that. That's just one small example. Spiritual gifts are not always what we think to be some grandiose, miraculous thing, but they are miraculous. Because when we exercise the gifts God gives us to build faith in one another, that's a miraculous thing. But Paul, and again, I close on this point, Paul addresses something that's very broken in the church. The reality that there's people in the church that have been made to feel inferior because maybe they did not have what others had. There was this group of haves and have-nots in the church which does not belong in the church in any way and any form. But Paul says, these are the members of the body which get the most honor. The poor and the weak. Those of you that think you're talented, that you're gifted, that God needs you, 
that before you were saved, you had all these abilities, and now that God's recruited you, you're like an all-star on Team Jesus? What does he say about those people? God does not have a use for you. You're going to get in the way of God's glory. You're going to touch God's glory. But those of you that are weak, you have come to the realization of the truth, that you have nothing to offer. That's a great place to be because from that point, God's going to lift you up. So Paul's saying, hey, that weaker class in your church, they understand. See, all of them were weak. All of us are weak. It's like Jesus saying, I did not come to heal the well, but to heal the sick. The reality is we're all sick. Some of us just don't know it. And for the church in Corinth, all of them were weak, but some of them thought they were really strong. They were superstars in God's army. God was blessed to have them and their talents and their abilities. And Paul says, no, we have no need of that. We want the weaker Ones, the ones that realize they have nothing to offer apart from Christ, but in Christ they can do all things. If you're here today and you feel that you have nothing to offer, you're in the right place. Because you don't. But now you're a blank slate and you can go to God in faith and say, God, use me. And trust that he will, because he has promised that. I'm going to close with this. If, if you think you can't be useful, let me give you a story from John Corson. John Corson writes about an event that happened at his church. He says an above-ground pool was donated to Applegate Christian Fellowship for their missions. It was a mission for handicapped orphans in Mexico. But because it arrived in what seemed to be a million pieces, try as they might, the mission staff was unable to assemble it. It wasn't more than a few days later, however, that my brother, Jimmy, who runs the mission, got a call from a man at Twin Peaks Bible College. I just feel like the Lord would have me come and spend some time at the mission, he said. I can't do much. I'm not a Bible teacher. I'm not a children's worker. I'm not a cook. I'm not a gardener. But I just feel I should come. Jimmy said, come on down. By the way, what did you do before you were in Bible school? The man said, I spent 20 years installing above-ground pools. (laughs) Within four hours of his arrival, the kids were swimming. God has given each of us, every single one of us, spiritual gifts. Paul says, use them. Use them. Let's put them in practice. Let's pray for opportunities. God, how can I build up my brothers and sisters in their trust, in their faith? Show me and use me.